Happy Monday. Happy Monday, everyone. This is Larry Sanders. Another episode of Sanders Says. We're excited. Excited about this day. Um, episode five of season two. We have a very special guest um, today to talk about um, not only the 50 years of hip hop, but his huge contribution to hip hop itself. Um, this man is the first one to win a Grammy for hip hop if you didn't know. Um, so we're gonna do a history lesson today. We're gonna get to know this man um, and uh, his powerful, powerful message. Um, so I'm excited, you know, if you if you tune in to Sanders Says, you know we're all about mental health, we're all about inclusion, we're all about financial growth, we're all about entrepreneurship, um, leadership. Uh, so I'm excited today to have this leader on our show. Um, I want to give a special shout out to our sponsors uh, over at Zar Wellness, ZarWellness.com. Go get your flowers, your topicals, your gummies, um, anything you need. And it's THCA, so it's shipped all over the nation, every state. You can obtain this and, uh, you know, get your medicine. So tap into ZarWellness.com. Also, after this, we're having an after party on X with our homies at Wake and Bake. So tune in to Wake and Bake Radio. Tap into X, and we're gonna have the after party for this show, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about everything we talked about. But I'm excited. With further ado, we're gonna bring to the stage Grand Mixer DXT. My brother. Yes, sir. Man, it is an honor to have you on this show today, man. It is an honor for real. Um, you know, such a fortunate opportunity. Excuse me. I said it's an honor for you, you know, for me to even be on your show, man. I'm I'm honored. Nah, nah, for sure, man. Thank you for uh, spending some time with us today. Um, you know, uh, really, you know, you have these great accomplishments uh, that we're gonna get to um, in life, and uh, really dig into some of these stories because I, I really want to get to know, uh, you know, how you how this all this came about. Um, but before that, you know, I wanna I wanna go back into you know, the younger you, you know, you as a child, um, you when you was, uh, you know, 11 years old at house parties, bartending. <laughs> <laughs> True story, man. Yeah. True Back story. to those days, you know, and, um, you know, just take, take me through that. Take me through that young boy. Um, and then you, you get into the music and, you know, the culture you were around at that time. Well, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a music an entertainment environment um, and a party environment because entertainment. So mm -hmm. uh, my mom was an inspiring uh, singer. Uh, she is a stink singer to this day. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my cousin, his mom, my aunt and uncle, they were musicians and uh, singers. And so this kind of environment was normal. So we grew up in it. You know, my sister is a dancer. She danced with uh, Forces of Nature, I think Alvin Ailey, that, that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, it was just in the house. So I grew up in that. When I think I was four years old, I got my first drum set. And then I got my first, the, and that drum set had like the Beatles on the head, one of those kind of on the bass <laughs> heads and stuff. Then um, I got my first real drum set, uh, I was in uh, sixth grade going into the seventh grade and I got my first real like professional style drum set. So I'm, I'm you know, I was raised and uh, just playing. Uh, I had an organ in my house since I was a child. So I and, mm -hmm. and records and all that stuff. So I'm, that's my environment. Right. And so it wasn't a huge shift for me to go into this new genre, a new expression in entertainment. Um, right. And so that that particular party was at my Aunt Audrey's house and um, which was common. These parties were common. We, we did them all the time. You know, every few weeks there was one of these kind of parties. And what made those parties interested, is, interesting is that um, the young people when we went there, we knew at some point of this mm -hmm. event, we had to perform. 
and you had to figure out what you're going to perform. And I think that party or the one after that, I performed Sly Stone, if you want me to say, stay, mm -hmm. I played the bass line. And I, I didn't sing. I couldn't sing and play at the time. So I just played the bass line over and over and over. And they started chipping in and singing, singing the line. But mm -hmm. that, that, that may be the same party I bought at 10, but it may not be. That's just so long ago. Um, right. But again, um, they said, okay, you're, you're a bartender. <laughs> they were just prepping me for this life. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I got a nickel, you know, for every uh, shot. And it, 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 they, they eventually took me. I wasted most of the, the alcohol, like spilling it all over the place. I did not know how to pour into a shot glass, none of that. And they just left me to it. And finally, right. you know, wasted a lot of it. They, they took me off. They fired right. me. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Well, so yeah, you... I, I made like I made like two or three dollars in nickels. Right, right, right. But that was that was worth something back then, though. That was that and, was. And keep in mind, you know, this whole time it's about music. The whole time, right. and after that, all of us had to get up and perform. You know, mm -hmm. my 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 cousin Rex had on you know the Hawaiian uh, what do you call it the thing the reefs that you wear. Right, the, the, with the flowers, the on the, the, the the uh the the a lay is a lay or something yeah. a lay or something like that. Came out yeah. with clothes on with a big afro wig, with two girls hanging on to his ankles, singing singing the Barry White songs. <laughs> That's crazy. That's <laughs> crazy. Laughing. But we, it was just hilarious. It, it was right. Yeah, I grew up with parties like that too. Though. I remember when I was younger, it was all about you know the the family gatherings and the parties, right. and um. Yeah, yeah, you know, it wasn't no social media, it wasn't no Facebook. You know, you had to pull up if you want to see somebody, you had to pull up on them, man. And uh, you know, that was a it was a different world. Yeah, but yeah. So then you you this kid, you in this party lifestyle. Um, you know, you growing up, your aunts, your your cousins, your sister, your mom, and then um, you know, you start messing around with turntables, right? Yeah. So a lot. Yeah, a lot. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so how did that? So how? So, so did the transition of, of incorporating turntables into? Uh, would you say it was disco at the time? No. Um, so, house parties was a, a, a norm for me. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I seen, I had seen certain things happening at these house parties that mm -hmm. that started happening during the so-called hip hop era that certain people are thinking that it's new then but if you lived in a house party environment like for instance needle dropping that was a old house party motif because there was only one turntable and my sister used to pick the needle up and if the grooves are set right on a particular record you could just drop it back down and it starts on time Mm -hmm. And so that was going on in house parties. Today, you know, people think that that's new, but it's actually not. But right. what, happened, what happened with me was, um, you know, just being around musicians and then I finally got my drums and I'm playing in a band. I became the, the, uh, the drummer at mm -hmm. John Philip Sousa uh, Junior High School. And that was 75 I became the drummer for John Philip Sousa Junior High School. And we had a band, like a band, big band and the orchestra. So I played for the orchestra. I played for the the, uh, the band and I played for the, the choir, the chorus and the choir. And so I was playing every day. Um, and then, you know, dancing was all, was already happening. You know, we, 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 we didn't call it b-boying at the time. You know, mm -hmm. did the bug in and 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 go, go off and all of that stuff, and then during that time we would we would play these records, you know, in the center, and I, that's when I first started hearing about Cool Hurt between seventy four seventy five, no seventy five, mm -hmm. late seventy seventy four to seventy five. I started hearing about Cool Herc, but I was too young to engage any of that. It was just a name, you know. Right, and, right. And so by 76, then we, you know, we, I started hearing more and more about it. And mm -hmm. um, and the end of 75, actually, 
Um, there were two D DJs in my neighborhood, uh, and they called themselves TNT Disco. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that was uh, Fat Tommy and Tony O'Gara. And they were the first guys to come outside and, you know, play records. They wasn't doing a bunch of scratching and nothing like that, but they had the equipment. Right. They were playing records. So that was my introduction to, to that world. And yeah. as a drummer, um, we're always looking through records for drum breaks to study. So what makes it interesting for me is that, you know, the hip hop thing just so happens to be based on drum breaks. Right. You know, so I was already in that because I'm studying drums. I'm studying mm -hmm. Idris Muhammad, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Steve Gadd, even Buddy Rich. I mean, I was studying everybody, Louis Belson, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, and I was also, you know, a dancer. I was also, you know, break dance. And so um, from there, we started, we, we started a band within our band in Sousa, junior high school. This is 75. We started a band within our band. Mm -hmm. And, and um, we didn't really play anywhere. We would just practice, you know, just practice playing at, at you know, at, at each other's homes, at friends' houses. But mm -hmm. in that, we would, some of us were also dancers. We were also b-boys. Remember, that's not we weren't called b-boys at the time, but we would we would go off at the parties, and right. so we wanted to practice in the hallway when the center was closed, but we didn't have turntables to extend the break. So we started making cassette tapes to keep the break going. Now, as a musician, and by the way, I just had this conversation with uh, uh, Grandmaster Flash yesterday. Mm -hmm. as a musician and as a drummer I'm automatically time sensitive you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. I'm aware of one two three four one two three four one two. right right so I'm already right. there so right. uh, uh, we were trying to figure out how to get the the the, the, uh, the cassette to edit seamlessly so the, the beat was on time because we're musicians mm -hmm. so we we found a way to do it and I'll, i'm gonna make a, a video of how we did that That's um, dope. so people can see this is before the pause button yeah that's okay. dope see i'm a producer so i'm a producer and uh you know i understand what you i understand exactly what you're talking about but um that automatic that automatic finding that metronome and finding that click that um, that rhythm you know right. and you know, yeah right yeah so we were all we were we were already musicians so that was just there you know, so now we're trying to synchronize the cassette so that when we practice, the beat just goes continuously. Right, right, right. That's, that's so, a lot of technique. That's a lot of technique. That's a lot of timing. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. musicianship. Yeah, that's 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 dope, man. That's amazing. That's before yeah. um, the yeah. machinery. Yeah, so we we finally figured out, and I, like I said, I'm going to make a, a tape very soon to show how we did that because there's some controversy, but really it's not controversy. It's just, we didn't really speak to each other. Uh, the, the, the hip hop DJs, we were all spread out and I never really played in the Bronx as much as the rest of these guys. I was in Westchester. And yeah, so that yeah. was an anomaly to them, but I was from the same time period. In fact, I was the last member of the master plan bunch, which is DJ smoke. One of the real founding fathers of our time. The three real founding fathers of our time is Mario, mm -hmm. Smokey, and right. of course, Who Hurt. And right. so I became a member of Smokey's crew because his partner, Rob DeGold, moved up to Mount Vernon and I met him up there. And that was early. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, we, we were trying to synchronize these beats so that we can keep dancing. And in doing that, we came up with a technique that enabled you to be on time and extend your breaks on time. So, right. And, and on the other side of town, Flash, my brother Flash, is working on his way of doing that. And he comes up with what's called the clock theory. And again, when, when you know, we thought we had a Eureka moment. When we saw Flash, we were blown away because he he was doing it with the turntables. We were doing it with cassettes. 
Mm -hmm. And he did it with the turntables and and he did not pick the needle up. He just spun the record back, which is uh -huh. the theory. Right. right. We, I, when I saw that, I was blown away. I was like, wow. But we had already had our own technique of, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, editing the music right. together with, without, um, uh, without a pause button. And so right. that, that went right into our cutting mechanism was based on the same thing. So the, the, the record button became our mixer, so to speak. Right. That was cross faded, the record button. And like I said, I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to make a video demonstrating that technique that very few people knew about, but that's how we started extending the breaks in uh, four measures, eight measures, you know, uh, uh, four, you know, four bars and stuff like that. All right, that's sweet. That's dope. And then you you got so you 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 were in the Bronx at this time. I was in the Bronx. We did uh -huh. that in the Bronx, but when we when I started really DJing, I went up into Westchester, which was like uh, Westchester. Okay. Yeah, Westchester for me is a a half a mile walk. Okay. And I'm in Mount Vernon, New York. Okay. And they were totally oblivious to what was going on in the Bronx at that time. Totally oblivious. <laughs> The DJ. Mm -hmm. I gotta, play, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta play the track. I want to play the track, just, just so you know. One thing I, I gotta say too, I grew up listening to this track from uh, the Herbie uh, Hancock, and man, I it was I didn't even know what I was listening to, but my dad loved this this song and he played it a lot <laughs> growing up. So <laughs> making the, uh, you know, I, I just I need to play, it, man, because it's uh. See, just connect to my Bluetooth. So when you when you made this track, and uh, you know you guys won a Grammy. Yep. What? I, I mean, I, that had to be that had to be huge for hip hop at the time, right? I mean, to be respected in that field. Um, was that was there a huge shift? Like, was that was you know as far as culture, magazines, uh, entertainment, like you say, the entertainment industry? Well, you know, the, the success of Rocket is a more or less a, a bittersweet one, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. I, 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 you know, I came up with what I did. Everyone basically put their own two cents into the record. Right. And it, to be honest, again, I, I was too immature to understand the, the end, the final mix of it. And I wasn't exactly excited about it. Right, you know? right, right. <laughs> I was like, man, y'all messed up my record. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, okay. and, yeah, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get it. And then finally, yeah. you know, uh, Bill had called me and said, hey, man, the, you know, we have a, a mega hit record. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, okay, well, that, that, okay, I get it. And then yeah. I realized, that it, it was about uh, different concepts being brought to the table and mixed and and, right. blended and, and working with each other from different uh, uh, musical uh, backgrounds and, and, right. and cultural. Uh, Daniel Ponce was from Cuba and right. he play, played the bata, you know, mm -hmm. the uh, instrument, drum instrument. And so it, it, it was a great experience and it was a, a right. great uh, lesson on um, uh, cultural expressions through music, right? Uh, um, and so, and then it, it it was so huge that you know it changed my life. You know, I I got on a, a plane and didn't come back for a whole year. You know, yeah, and yeah. I had to play in in in, a, in the band. You know, in Herbie's, and that's you know I wasn't even remotely thinking that I would get a call from Herbie Hancock to play in his band like right you know i was watching him on don kirshner's rock concert you know saying to myself one day i played this is a true story i said that i would play with him and here it is i'm in the band in the grammy. <laughs> at, at, at the grammys looking at yeah. you know, philip bailey and yeah you know michael jackson lionel richie james yeah. brown kashif you know all of these people wow. that I, I grew up studying their music you know, the Ohio right. play, you know, 
and here I am up there. So it it was a it was a strange experience, man. It did yeah, it, it, yeah. it took a while for it, it to impact me where I can process what was happening. I actually spoke to Michael Jackson like that. I I'm never in my life that I think that that would actually happen. Yeah. You know, and here I am. I mean, I'm standing. I didn't realize he was that tall. Too. <laughs> you know, Mike's like, tall. He's tall. Yeah, he was way taller than me. I, <laughs> I never thought Mike was tall. That's crazy. He didn't. Yeah, it was like, oh, he said that out loud because he was like, man, you really had us fooled. He said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> we thought those were real robots. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, we got one of the first real a massive standing ovation at the Grammys for that performance. And uh, yeah. just an incredible experience, you know. And yeah. I'm hoping that, you know, people from my community was watching it so they can see, you see, I'm from our neighborhood and I'm up here. Right. You know, I'm here. You, you can right. do and you can experience a dream that you had. You can get right. it, you know. Right. Uh, I, you know, I was insane. I practiced... 10 hours yeah. a day, you know, and I, I was playing my drums eight hours, trying to get my thousand hours in. And um, it was after the battle between Cool Herc and, and DJ Smoke is when I went from playing drums eight hours a day and turntables three and four hours to turntables eight hours a day. I, mm -hmm. I switched after that night. Right. And and never look back, really. You know, right. and and uh, so it's just a, an, an amazing uh, accomplish for everyone who participated in that because it changed music forever. Right. And and it was the beginning of an introduction of of the the new technology in in uh, for musical use. Yeah, I was gonna say that. I was gonna say that definitely it was a cornerstone, cornerstone song. Um, you know, you I think everything you were doing by with the turntable, that was a cornerstone you guys uh you know, a cornerstone for hip hop and yeah. rap. But you know, now I look at the climate of hip hop, you know, because I hear you talk a lot about uh social engineering, right? You talk about uh words and you know how words are engineered through culture to do certain things, maybe distract, maybe to entice. Um, do you feel like overall what you created has been used for good? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer because it's. <laughs> but thank you. That's why I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you 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 went there already. You went there fast. Yeah. All right. Well, no, I just. No, I, no, see, good, I, good, I see. I see it. I see it in your, in your in your energy a little bit. It's good. It's good. It's good. good. Um, I didn't know if we were going to go there this soon, but we're there. So, um, you know, I spoke recently at a event in the Bronx where I was honored along with uh, Cold Crush, Jimmy D, uh, a lot of people, you know, and. It was a great gathering of, of us and, you know, people were speaking and I was just listening to some of the speaking and it, I, I realized that people don't want to touch that area. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it the, the fiddler syndrome. Remember fiddler from Roots? Yeah. Yes. The fiddler syndrome kicks in. Oh, no, don't. Don't don't say nothing, Master. Don't be mad, you know. Yeah. And you're right. not gonna no paper. And you won't be able to buy that twenty million dollar watch. Right, right, right. And so, you know, I was during the eighties, before I even did rocket. You know, right. I was talking about the impact that our music is going to have on the future mm -hmm. and on the, on our children. Right. And then when we started seeing some of these social issues that were not good 
for the community. I started, you know, doubling down on it, going to these panels, going to these hip hop conventions and things. And I would um, myself and uh, T.C. Islam, bless his heart, he's no with us. But he and I would go to these panels and we, we would call ourselves panel busters because we'd walk in there and they're talking about things that are not addressing what we're actually seeing in the community. Mm-hmm. And we, we, would, we would just blow it up. Like, listen, we, y'all in here talking about, you know, jewelry and, and sneakers. Right. You know, and um, we have a serious problem. Right. You know, it's coming. It's going to get worse, you know. And uh, so we're here now. And, right. you know, there's a reason why KRS-One was not mm-hmm. You know, there's a reason why Public Enemy is no longer mainstream media in regards to our music, you know. Right. And, and now through admission from certain uh, people in the industry, we know that it was a uh, calculated plan to get the result that where we are now, where you can go on YouTube and watch young black men murder other young black men. Right, right. And played on YouTube. Right. And I don't, you don't hear much from these these guys who perpetrated on video and on their in their lyrics that they're really tough. Yeah. They're 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 hardcore, you know, gangsters. But what gangster lets somebody direct their children to the morgue or to the prison system? Yeah, yeah. You know, and so it be, it's become apparent to me that none of these guys were really gangsters. None yeah. of them. Yeah. None of them. Not one. Their gangsterism is focused on their community because their community, our community is broken. Mm -hmm. But if this business generates a trillion dollars and we don't have one hip hop hospital, yeah, there are no gangsters. Yeah. How you say that hip hop hospital? Yeah, that, that stuck with me. That stuck with me. Um, I mean, I can keep going. There's no hip hop hospital. There's no hip hop university. There's no, there's there's no nothing that comes from this so-called trillion dollar business that we supposedly had, uh, you know, a major part of somebody else got that trillion dollars in 50 years. What do we have? We have video young black men murdering each other. We have artists showing off, $20 $20 million watches that if your heart stops, that watch is not going to do nothing for you. It's not going to start your heart. It's not going to feed you if you're starving. You know, we have these young men with all kinds of weapons. I don't even know how they get, get these types of weapons. But are you trained, really? Can you change a jammed barrel in the middle of a firefight? Can you switch from a long gun to a short gun in, based on the proximity or the environment that you're in? Are you trained to use those weapons properly? Because if you're not, you put a target on your head because mm-hmm. you have the weapon. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So we're seeing a a long-term plan played out. It's almost at its end. And we can clearly see what's coming. What's coming for these young men running around with these guns and these young men going into these stores and uh, just ripping everything out of there and running out. You know, this this is all a, 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 a show. It's laid out to justify what's coming. The other day I heard a rap artist talk about he's building a, a uh, you know, underground shelter for himself. Rick Ross. It's unfortunate that he said that. 
because that's what you don't do. See, this is this is shows you the mindset that we're dealing in. You don't tell a person you build. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> They're going right to your house. <laughs> yeah, it's like, dude, you, I'm not doing it now. Yeah. You know because there are people who are highly trained. Yeah. Who's going to wait for you to build that. And then they're going to overwhelm you and take it. Right, right. You know, they have skills that you do not have. Yeah. They have training that none of these guys we see running around shooting other people sitting at their, in their cars. They don't have this training. But they right. have weapons, so they will be approached by people who train, who have a thousand hours, two thousand hours in on aiming and shooting, right? Three thousand hours in on changing weapons, right? You know, um, but while we're looking at our sisters who have, you know, I, I don't even want to touch that right now because it's it's really troubling. What's what's happening? But a, a culture with no moral responsibility to its youth is not a culture at all. Right. Yeah, no, that's a deep one. That is. What's, what do you think? I mean, I always, I mean, to say the youth is the future is it's very, you know, people throw that around so much. But I mean, what other, what other responsibility do you think we have other than trying to change the culture? And I mean, the culture is the music. Like a lot of what you did dictated a lot of what we did right um and music does dictate a lot of how we move and then we express ourselves through the music um well, that's that's how it's been shaped it's been shaped now that what you see on video represents what you should consider doing <laughs> you know um we are not talking to each other we don't communicate well with each other especially with this language that I personally now think that we never really understood how it actually works, mm -hmm. but we use it to to get a, to get through the day. Um, right. That's another problem. Um, Where I'm mixing? One yeah. second. Just give me one second. I'm gonna be real. My pot, my son, they got loose. I got to get him right. One second. I'm, I'm gonna jump right back on you. We're gonna finish this hey, conversation. Sure. You, want me, you want to call me back? No, nah, I'm gonna be right. Be right. With you. Okay. So while he's gone, I'm going to do a piece of uh, Hustlers Convention. Now, nah, maybe not. Check, check. Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Be back. I was going to do a poem, but then, then I said, no, nah, let me not. You know, I don't know if you were still rolling or not. Oh, no, no, no. That's dope. You got to, you know, I, I definitely write myself. Um, so, yeah, you know, uh, you know, we're talking a little bit about what you were doing and um, how the, you know, the responsibility of the music. I think you said how it was shaped, right? How it's shaped now. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty much laid. If you go back and really analyze it, you, it's it's well. It's a well written script, a well written social engineered agenda script, and you can see it now, step by step, what has happened and why are we where we are. You know, money is an incredible tool incredible um, to get people to do things that they they know they should not do. 
and the the idea that these material things outweighs the most important things to your community has been the most devastating aspect of what has happened in our community. Mm. You know, I still see grown men standing online to spend $500 on a pair of sneakers. Mm -hmm. uh, for what? Now, if I made a sneaker or shoe or whatever, and I was outside with my shoe that I made, and it only cost me to make the shoe three dollars. No one's gonna buy it. Man, you only spent three dollars on those shoes. Do you know it costs about three dollars to make a pair of Nikes? Well, I think now it's not even it's more about who who wears it than how much it costs. Right. You know? And yeah, so now it's who wears it. Like who cares? Mm -hmm. You know, well, and so imagine this being in the back of your mind that there's something that you must have. And I'm not I'm using Nike just to let's just say shoot who whatever brand. I'm not focusing on Nike, but just whatever brand, you know, th these things were done over time. That's where I'm getting at. That that desire to have these things, it was slowly implemented into the community to now where it's just, you know, you feel that you must have it or you won't feel full, complete without these things. Yeah, me, me uh, I wasn't was it going? I wasn't. I hadn't had plans to be in the NBA. I wanted to be an anthropologist, right? So, I wanted to go sit in uh, different cultures for you know years, months at a time, dissect them, take this information because I know it's so valuable, and be able to you know sell it or create my own business through it. Because knowing how people you know work, what makes them tick, what colors they're attracted to, food, smell, um, you know, all this goes into why we are you know, attracted to McDonald's while we, you know, all these big corporations have done these social experiments to understand how we work um, and through the music as well. Um, so, it, you know, you, by you saying it's by design, I de that definitely resonates with me. I understand that completely. You know, everything is by design. You know, our it's choices. It, you know, um, yeah. uh, I've been at most of my talks now, I bring up this term, uh, it's a hypothesis called the Saphir Wharf hypothesis. Yeah, I like this. Saphir Wharf hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And what it says is it, this hypothesis is that if you change a person's language, mm -hmm. you're also rewiring their brain computer. Right. And looking back at what we, we have experienced. It's leaning to that being actually true mm -hmm. because every few years we get shock tested. Somebody gets killed up by the police and everybody's outside for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. But when, when, when Pookie and Ray Ray chop each other to pieces, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Community doesn't go, and I'm talking about within their own community. No one right. says, hey, man, you're killing people in your own community or any community. But only when that happens do people galvanize. Somebody comes out, some leader, handpicked leader comes out, says a few words. He may get arrested, goes in the front door, goes out the back door, gets a TV show. And we go back to our normal uh, pattern that they have us in and at some point you know you, you have to go wait a minute man we've done this several times and nothing has changed and these people who have been put in the front of us as supposed leaders nothing has changed right. I'm not picking on anybody I'm putting let's put it on the table nothing mm -hmm. is changing so who are you really working for? Right. 
You know, who are all of these people screaming at podiums, yelling and screaming and all of this stuff? Nothing is changing. Right. And so how do you change things? Because mm -hmm. that is not working. And so right. in, in a real culture, if it doesn't work, you discard it. Right, right. You find, you find the best of what your ancestors produced and you replicate that for your community. I got that from Professor Smalls, and I live by that today. And, you know, we, we are in this position now where we have spent an entire generation's time doing absolutely nothing. And we see the results of that. When I mean nothing, I'm talking culturally. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to steer our young brothers into a place where they don't think they have no options. Check that out. Mm. And so they are now looking for ops. Mm. And it's being broadcasted all around the world. And it's making a statement through this broadcast mm -hmm. to the whole world. Yeah. What well, solution? I mean, it's, it's 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 embedded. It seems so embedded in the uh, in the language, um, in the the, the design, uh, because this is like you said. While we in our communities are, you know, killing each other, in another community is a lot of money going in somebody's pocket. Absolutely. Um, so, so, and by design, I mean, cause we, I think is there's progress, there's progression through the conversation, right? I don't think that there's nothing actually been done yet. Maybe something that I've haven't seen. Um, but I think through the conversation, people are maybe less likely to be such, so attracted to their life. So attracted to, um, the things that, uh, that are glorified that are, you know, hindering us that we're killing each other. So, I know everything's about consumption. Music, music is consumption. What we see, we consume, eat, we consume. I put some on my skin, on my skin, I'm gonna consume it. So music also I consume. If I'm consuming music that's that's telling me to be destructive, I'm gonna be fighting that destructive demon because that's not that's not who I am. I'm not a destructive person. I'm very creative. So I gotta I gotta consume things that are alive, things that are creating creative, you know, energy. But I had to understand it about myself because I'm attracted to the trap music. I'm attracted to the bump. I'm attracted to the, the drums. I'm attracted to the bass. But I know through anthropology, this is because this is where I'm from. I can go and dissect you know, where somebody's from right now and they know nothing about their culture. I can come back and lead them any, in any direction I want just by knowing what they culture likes to do. You know what I mean? So, right. um, and we have that disconnect from our culture. So there's a blind side there where, um, you know, we can be blindly led, uh, not even knowing that, you know, these are things that we are naturally attracted to. So well, I, I, I truly believe that. It's also, it's also conditioning. You have to mm -hmm. be conditioned first to be taken advantage of. Right. And our environment conditioned us to function the way we're functioning. So as soon as you have access to change your condition to what you perceive as a better way of life, you're going to take it. You're going to run for it. You know, the, the social engineers who have been studying us for a very long time know exactly how to get us to the young people to do what they're doing. And it took 20 years to give us what we have now. 20 years of these 20 year olds, 20 years ago, at two, one, two, three, four, and five, they're hearing this music. And in this music, for at least 80% of it, it is kill, destroy, kill, destroy, mm -hmm. along with the video games, you see, along with the music videos. And so we are now. This was what we gave them. We did that. We participated in that. 
the rap industry became a weapon. And the weapon is, was pointed at our babies. Mm -hmm. And so now we see the result of our culture being weaponized from within as well as outside. Mm -hmm. You don't think that those secret meetings everybody's been talking about, there were no brothers sitting there, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know. You know. Huh? No, that 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 plays into uh the words as well. I, I like this. I like this word weapon because most weapons are also tools, and most tools are also weapons. Right. So right. you know, here we have these secret meetings that everybody knows about now. And the, what what happens to us is the first thing we think is a room full of white men. That's not true. Right. There's brothers that we know were in those rooms. Mm -hmm. Um, when you engage from an earlier stage of your social engineering, the guys who would sell crack to pregnant women in their own neighborhood, right? It, it's 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 even easier to get them in a room and say, "We're going to make you a millionaire if you help us steer this music down this road and get all these young people to start focusing on this style." of uh you know communication through music mm -hmm. so and we we see some of them on tv today yeah you know and it this is the, the one thing that i really think needs to be addressed is that that meeting no one wants to touch that you know there was these meetings where they started you know whacking hut and correctional corporations of america and you know these white men you know, all started buying shares in these these private prisons. Trust me, you you go check a couple of brothers' portfolios, they, they're not going to want you to look at it. Right, right. You know? Yeah. We, we got zips in the wires, homie. No, nah, no, nah, I believe it. No, nah, I believe it. But that's, you know, <laughs> how, how else do you eat us up unless you go from within, you know? Uh, we're going we gonna to follow a familiar face right? Um, every time. I think a lot has been exposed. Um, and, you know, if this whole thing blows up, we're going to still have music. We're going to still need music. And like I just, you know, like I said, once was, you know, if it's a tool, once if it's a weapon, it can also be a tool. And I think music, hip hop first started as a tool for freedom. You know, it was like, uh, you know, uh, freedom songs, expression, um, dance, uh, you know, and, you know, they've been, it's been weaponized, but it's a tool. You know, I think it's a tool ultimately. Yeah, so it's, it's not like we need to dis discard it. We need to fix it. Mm -hmm. We need to put it back in the right case that it came out of, you know, right. and, and put the instructions back in the, in, in the case with right. proper right. instructions how to use this. Right. You know, right. it, it is something that we've done from the beginning of time. These mm -hmm. these expressions, you know, and, and to bring us back into the, the hip hop world, um, you know, a lot of my brothers are saying, you know, we started, we created, we this. No, we reconnected. This is not the birth of hip hop. This is the 50 years of us reconnecting to these ancient cultural expressions that is in our genes, mm -hmm. this is an epigenetic experience, you know, right. and we are using technology of today, but the actual expressions, the, the thought of seeing things in your head and putting them on a wall, we can go and find those in caves. You see what I'm saying? Um, to think that, you know, you, you hear in rhythms and you don't test the limitations of your body to these rhythms that would that would be dismissive of you to think that that happened now. To rhyme rhythmically, even though this is not our language, we are part of time and space, mm -hmm. you know? And so we, we it, you know, I was just talking to my brother, Grandmaster Flash, just yesterday, we had a great conversation. And, you know, I was saying to him, that, you know, we were cut off from our knowledge from the knowledge of ourselves and our history and all of this. And this 
one particular thing, these cultural expressions, this is ancient stuff. Even the technology you have to question based on who we are because Kemet is sitting there. You know what I'm saying? And so we, we have to take a closer look at what this is that we're actually doing because the whole planet is now doing it from these so-called terrible people. Right. You know what I'm saying? The whole planet's doing it now. Mm-hmm. You know, and in our time, in our time, it started to come together in this place in New York City called the Bronx. In our time, it wasn't invented in the Bronx. We reconnected to the energy first. Right. The Bronx. A lot of my brothers hate to hear, hate me, hate for me to say this because they feel that they need to have the credit for starting hip hop. That's the terminology that we're using in our time to explain these cultural expressions that are in our genes. Right. Our ancestors did that, and now. We find video of breakdancers from the 1920s and the 30s. We didn't see that. We never saw that until now. We, right. But we were doing it. You know, right. Pygmy Markham, uh, Hoke and Poke, and these people, the, the gospel choirs, they were spitting back in the 30s. We never seen any of that until today, till now. But we right. were doing it. And a lot of my brothers, they get they get confused because they're like, well, they're saying that we didn't start it. I'm saying that that's the best thing to think is this has this is part of a lineage of expressions that's in us. Right, this, right. This is an epigenetic experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And right. that, that's a that's a whole nother that's a whole nother show we should do on that. Um, yeah. And and so you know I'm I'm sitting here now looking looking at all of these things that I've been discovering that we did before we in the seventies uh, tuned into this energy. And it's, it's one of the greatest things to know as a person that been through it, to imagine finding out that you mean I'm connected to all of that and I didn't right. see it and it's, I did it anyway. Yeah. Do you know how special that is? Yeah. That's, so that it, is special. It makes sense that somebody has to control this part of me. Right. Because inside is a connection that can't be broken. No, for sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, very and spiritual. It's, it's, it's very spiritual and it's it's very powerful, man. Because I you know, one day I was with Kumo D at in the studio and I showed him the gospel choirs. I showed it to him and he was silent. <laughs> for about 15 minutes because they yeah. feet and I'm showing it look man one guy took the uh, rapper's delight and he put it behind him and they're perfectly in time and yeah. he, he's and, he, and then he he finally spoke you know what he said you ready what he said <laughs> he said them niggas is biters <laughs> <laughs> He said the niggas was biting in, in the twenties. <laughs> and we were having a spaceship and a time machine. How do how do how do you do that? Man, we 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 we, 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 we I was on the floor crying. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah, yo, you got you got to take that L. He said the niggas is biting. Yeah, he was quiet for about fifteen minutes. <laughs> he said, Nah, but nah, yeah, but that's crazy. But that's no, you're right though. With the technology, there's no way they saw or could even research that video right okay you know what i mean we see it and we realize that hey man and it was weird is a lot of brothers see that and they get angry about it like man that's not hip-hop that's the rule this we're just calling it this when, ain't yeah, like when did it get did, when did it turn into hip-hop i think that's i think that's something that kids don't understand as well they don't they, they see a line between hip-hop and everything else they don't. They don't see that it, it was submerging. Brothers, like, oh, Hollywood. He wasn't hip hop. He was disco. He he didn't let the b boys dance at his parties. If you're in a mature place, mm-hmm. if people are dressed and they don't want nobody flying around on the sliding across the floor, no, that doesn't mean that you're not part of the culture. In that environment, that's not happening. So at that time, b boys were like a staple of this is a hip hop. 
It's hip hop. The, the the dance, the music is first, mm -hmm. right? And again, Dennis Coffey, and and I think they were from Detroit. They're not from the Bronx. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? You know what I'm saying? For the music, you know, Michael Viner and the incredible Bongo Band. I think that was the West Coast. You mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, so the music, James Brown is from Augusta, Georgia. Yeah. You know, and so it's 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 a universal uh, expression through music, mm -hmm. and music speaks a particular language that resonates with us genetically. Uh, 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 the rhythms, the, the, you know, we we once we heard those rhythms, it resonated through us, and it's like, well, take out the piano, take out that, take out this just so happens to be these beats mm -hmm. that we gravitated to that made right. us doing these dances and stuff. And where where's that come from? You already know. You yeah. see what I'm but we're not we're not educated enough to make these connections at that time. We're just doing it. We was just doing it. But if you stop and go, well damn, why did we just say just play the break? Mm -hmm. Just play the drum beat. Right, right, right. And just loop that. And just loop that. That's now, crazy. Yeah. That's ancestors. Right, right, right. True. We, we didn't. Now, that, we talked. We, didn't we, we talked earlier. We talked, but you talked. We talked earlier about. Now that's now. I'm trying to connect. I'm connecting two dots. There's something that's innate in us, right? Yep. And then we talk about maybe a divine connection spiritually. But then, what if you know? What if this is by design? What if you know someone gave you a plate? you know, a plate full of food, knew, knowing you were going to pick out the, the spaghetti and the and the, and the the meatballs, <laughs> and that was going to be the moneymaker. <laughs> but they couldn't pick out the spaghetti and the meatballs. It would look right if they was doing it. They right. needed you to pick out the spaghetti and meatballs. Man, you, you, just, you just hit the ball out the park, bro. Home run. <laughs> that was a home run because that's exactly what they did. They yeah. knew it was coming. They've seen it before. They have, it, they have footage of it. They didn't go, yo, that's not new. Look, we got footage of that. They didn't say nothing. Mm -hmm. I was thinking we stumbled onto something new. Mm -hmm. And they created something just for us. Mm -hmm. It's called the entertainment business. Yeah. Check out that word. Entertainment. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. man. <laughs> When, when you stop and say it, you go, man, something, something's not right. <laughs> Entertainment. Like, that means you're keeping something inside. Entertainment. In my mind, that means you're entertained. Yeah, if you really break it down. Yeah. And wow. so in the entertainment business, they have extracted our cultural wealth from us. Every culture, uh, uh, you know, they thrive off of their cultural expressions and they make their, their wealth through their cultural expressions. Chinese food, Chinese, you know, everybody has their thing that they do. And our thing is exp it's global expression. We are the global expression people because what we do, the whole world does it. And I, I don't really have to say much about it. All we got to do is turn on the TV now or look all around the world. And this Supposed it ghetto expression from the South Bronx, which is all fabricated, is now in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's now part of everything. He, I, I mean, I, I, I've seen some of the illest rap artists, Caucasian rap artists, bananas. I mean, bananas. You know, and 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 Eminem and all of that. You know, and good for him. You know what I'm saying? Bananas. But we 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 don't stop and go, hey, this is our cultural expression. And we don't see the returns of disseminating our cultural expressions to the world. Mm -hmm. What we got is videotapes of Pookie shooting Ray Ray through the fucking windshield of his car. That's unacceptable. 
you know? And so we're in a place now where, where, where the men have to make a decision on mm. what, what is a man? What really is the job of a man in regards to a culture? Right. Like I said, a culture with no moral responsibilities to its youth is not a culture at all. Right. And so it, we need superheroes. And fortunately, some superheroes are real. And so we, we have to begin the, the, the hard and painstaking task of mm-hmm. calling out our brothers mm-hmm. and not being afraid to do it. Yeah. And say, my man, we, we turn in the page, bro. We turn in the page. No yeah. more. No more. I, I, it, it's look, look at the condition. Where, where is that going? Where is that going to go? I feel like that's the way I feel like that's the, that's the way it's going. You know, I think, you know, it's, it's funny. We'll fight something until women adapt it. Once women start, that ain't cool no more. Then the homies start, that ain't cool no more. The culture starts, that ain't cool no more. I think, you know, the music is there. And I think a lot of, from what I'm feeling, you know, a lot of my, my friends are older, younger. They don't want to listen to it. You know, they, there's, there's still that. And, and I, I blame it on this, right? We we're pack animals. No one wants to be alone. No one wants to be outcasted. So people will let go of the truth in order to stay a part of the group. Right. And because the- isolation will kill you, right? Isolation is the one thing that you your mental can't fight. Because somebody put you in a box by yourself, it's going to drive you crazy. Right. And so the social engineers who are shaping and the, the, directing the path that our community is on, they're very much aware of all of that. Mm-hmm. And that's what they're using. They know that. And so, you know. Do we fight fire with fires? You know? Well. Is it, is it the only way to move the masses is through social engineering? Yeah. Elijah Muhammad made a statement in regards to Black folks, melanated people, separating themselves so they can get themselves together. Mm -hmm. Mm. You can't be in the midst of the person who has taken every single thing from you Mm -hmm. and try to heal yourself. Right. That is absolutely impossible to do. And even if you mean well, you're not healing yourself so you can attack somebody. You just want to heal yourself to heal yourself. So you can be better. You can be more productive in society. Right. Who wouldn't want to see a people be more productive in their society? Who wouldn't want to see people not shooting each other over foolishness? Who wouldn't want to see that? You know what I'm saying? Why is that? How is it possible that that's just normally played on social media? How is that even possible? Right, right. When you, you see, if you yeah. see the wrong thing on social media, you get blocked. Right. By the wrong person. When you can't make certain comments, you are in serious trouble. Yeah. You can say nigga. Yeah. But but you can't say other derogatory comments. So what that says clearly is that this is by yeah. design. And right. people right. who are running this are the enemy of the of our people. And this is how they're thinking. We don't may not think that, but this is how they're thinking. They wouldn't do these things if they didn't feel this way. Right. You have to look at people's actions and they tell you who they are. Mm-hmm. And we, through social media, we have this, there are people that exist in this world whose sole objective is to do us in. And they're not stopping. Mm -hmm. That's their sole objective. 
is to destroy us. And they are doing a great job at this time. And to keep us where we are, it's always an illusion of progress. And no one says progress is an absolute because look at what's going on on social media. Mm. That term pro pro uh, pro uh, progress is a very, very interesting word. Yeah. See, I say, and I say that because a little bit more of what I see that on, in, in real life than what I see on social media. So I, I, I say, you know, because of, I feel like the vendetta is, is so, is so large. It's so um, unique that things can be displayed in a way in which you may feel like there is no progress. And that mentally is going to put everybody in a state of fear in a state of uh, hopelessness in a state of, that's more, if there was progress, we wouldn't see it. They wouldn't show it to you. They would, they were, they're going to show you the fear and the, uh, the destruction as much as they can to keep you in that state. So that's why I say there's progress because mentally I'm going to stay in, I'd rather stay in that mindset because even if, it, even if there was, they wouldn't show it. I, right. I, would, I wouldn't know unless I was walking around in every neighborhood. I, I totally agree with what you're saying, but let's look at the word progress. From what position is that progress? I so think conversation. I, I think I think conversation. I think that people are willing to have that conversation because before it was like, eh, shut up, man. It's just music. Man, right. be quiet, bro. I just I'm just listening. People don't say that no more. You sound stupid saying that now. That's like saying, shut up, man. It's just a cheeseburger. Shut up, man. It's just McDonald's. It's right. just McDonald's. You know what I mean? People are getting more conscious of what they're consuming. Right. They are. And so that's why I say that's the that to me, that's progress. Yeah, that's progress in the matter of health. Uh, of 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 but what about Men Mental health is where the digression is occurring. Hmm. To normalize murder, where it's actually a daily viewable site, is insanity at its best. Mm -hmm. And just imagine if that was another people. That shit would have lasted one day. One day of, you know, uh, a, a, a Jewish guy shooting another Jewish guy through the uh, well, you know, a European Jewish person. Well, let me well let me let me ask you this: What do you what's your take on everything that's happened in the Middle East as far as that much visual? Because I I feel like every it was every day for a month I was seeing somebody get blown up, a baby, a half a baby or something, a leg over here, an arm over there, a hospital getting blown up. They were they, they were showing that for a reason, right? There's 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 always a vendetta. There's always a reason because they they don't show. They show and they don't show, and they choose what they show, and it's not by accident. It's always by design. So, what do you think the design was for that? Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it appears that the and you're talking about the Palestinian situation because there's war. Yeah, just, well, just the well, well, not so much of the situation, more of why we saw so much of the situation because just like we see so much destruction, they show us so much destruction in our community to keep us in a certain state, right? Why do you think so that so much of that was visualized? Because that was, to me, that was more, more destruction between a race, two races than I've ever seen other than black people visually not heard about, but actually seen with my own two eyes. No, well, I mean, I, I hear you. Um, I think part of it is to keep certain narratives going. Um, mm -hmm. To be a Jewish person is a practice of a religion. Um, there are Jews in Ethiopia. There's Jews in South Africa. There's Jews in Nigeria. And these people are Jewish. And their, their Jewish heritage is older than the people in Israel today. Um, and so when people say Jews and race at the same time, it, it's confusing. J the practice of Judaism and, and Hebrew faith is a religion, not a race. And somehow there's this, there's this attempt to make being a Jew 
have some sort of gen, uh, race racial uh, design to it. And it's confusing a lot of people. Um, and it's okay for people, Europeans to be Jewish or Africans to be Jewish. And wherever you're from, you can practice the religion of Judaism. But to say that these people are Jews and it's their race, I, I disagree with that. I, I think they have every right to practice Jewish religion, but to say it's that they're the only Jews on the planet, that would be absurd because we, we it's clearly that the Ethiopian uh, people they refer to as Falasha is practicing Judaism long before those people even probably existed, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, from my research, uh, that conversion is, is maybe the, uh, you know what, I don't have it in front of me to say it and I don't want to make a mistake, but it's not as old as you think. And they have every that religion and, and, and defend their lives if they're being attacked. But I think what's going on there is, is something uh, way outside of what we're being told it is. There's another agenda to what we're seeing. Okay. No, I believe that. I believe that. You know, I think it's, I just, you know, um, you know, connecting the dots between, you know, the awareness, the the public, I mean, the social design um, uh, and then the social consciousness and how we're being led in different ways for different reasons. It always interests me in what they show because I don't want to watch the news very much. Um, but when I when they blast something out and they have a narrative, um, I always question it, you know, because I know, you know, I know my uh, my best interests ain't always in mind <laughs> when they when they trying to, when, you know, when, when, whatever they do. So, you know, I, I constantly question whatever they question, whatever they show me. Right. Um, and, you should, and everyone should, because right. well, the television, that's the purpose of it is to steer your consciousness down you know, where they can shape your your thoughts right. and act in a desired manner. And so that's what the real purpose of Tell Live Vision is for. It's for right. Tell you know, Live Vision. Right. Yeah, for conditioning. It, the human mind is only as valuable as the information you feed it. Right. If you I know why you plan on words. Right. If I can control the information that's going into your brain computer. I can control right. how I think. Right. So that's what do you what 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 have you uh practiced any other languages or found well, value in any other well I, I started to when my, my brother was alive because he, he was speaking this this prison prison gibberish that I, I had to try to learn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I, I didn't understand it. He started talking, he spent so much time in prison. Um I almost didn't understand him. He was speaking English, but it was insane. You right, know? right. He's, the, on, he's, yeah. he's deceased now. And so I, that was my only uh, reason for wanting to, because that was my brother. Uh, and so I had to try to communicate with him uh, better than right. communication. I always, I, I always thought about, um, and I'm, I'm still thinking about this all the time, of creating a language within my family. Because you know, it's just sounds. You know, if you have a, if you have an origin and a base, which we do the English language, we can create another language just based on sounds. We attach definitions to sounds, and you know, we have a language. Right. I, I heard one of the professors um, from our community say that you know, Kiswahili should be in a required language in our community, mm -hmm. and it it, it again. Uh, that brings us back to Saphir Wolf hypothesis. You know, uh, if you change a person's language, you also are changing the wiring of their brain computer. Right, and, right. And we can clearly see something's happened. Something's happened to us through this language. Right. <laughs> right. So it that that it appears to be true. Um, 
every few years, yeah. uh, you, you, we go out in the street and do the same thing and, and riot and come up with new songs. We got a whole album now. Who streets, streets, hands up, I can't breathe, no justice, no peace. You know, every, right. and then we go back home and we wait for the next uh, social experiment to to go down, so we can we can do that again. But the, right. that's enough. That's enough. Never happens. Yeah. You know, it's just the same thing. Go back to your normal behavior. I'm I'm working on a a, a project called the journey, and it's 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 my research for this. It's it's going to be it's it it was supposed to be just a record, but it's turning into a stage performance. Mm -hmm. And the research that I'm doing on it is I'm uncovering some of the most incredible historic events that happen in this country that no no one wants to talk about because you can't you got to find it you know yeah yeah I found found several. Uh, um, Rosewoods <clears throat> and um, of black towns that were mm -hmm. destroyed. Uh, uh, um, I found several of them all around the country. Then I started finding all of these uh, uh, towns that were drowned out, flooded out, mm -hmm. underwater. I just right. found recently in New York State a black community that is now underwater. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we, we are the victims of a cruel reality mm -hmm. that we try to just find a space so we can just feel okay. And so we, we, we throw all of that out so we can move forward. Mm -hmm. We don't want to talk about it. We, you know, we don't want to think about it, but it appears that there's a new way of this destruction, and it is it is consensual through ignorance. But am I making sense? No, I understand. I, I, what I was saying earlier, we will people will let go of the truth in order to be a part of the crowd. Yeah, that's exactly. You are one thousand percent correct, and so. You know where where do we go from here with this situation? We we have this. I don't know what you want to call it, but it, it is within the last three years something happened that's not normal mm -hmm. to everybody, right? You know, and it appears that it's not over, mm -hmm. and it's not looking good, and so I. I I don't know, man. I, I think that uh, I'm going to start taking some yoga lessons so I can bend it. <laughs> well, you know, I'll take it back to your to your record. I'll take it back to your record you did, and when you when you when you when you uh, got the Grammy, it was a collective, right? It was right. a collective of of people from all around the world contributing to the cornerstone. Of a shift in a in a culture, in a shift in, a, in in something that would lead lead us somewhere, right? And I think, you know, you you're coming out with your book, you know, you're gonna, you know, your journey or your stage performance, you know. I think that <clears throat> collectively, right now, there's another point in time where there's gonna be a cornerstone for another shift. And something that you can't even see, right? Because you know, you was in there playing, y'all hitting the needle, you know, picking it up and dropping it, and creating something through an idea, through a connection, right? And one thing that I will say, we going we learn how to free ourselves. We gon' we gon' we gonna figure out how to be free Absolutely. eventually. So I think that that's also innate, and um, it takes some it takes some runaway slaves. It takes some people to build some railroads. <laughs> they, they, they go look crazy, and everybody gonna be like, "Bro, what are you doing, bro? Like, they gonna kill your ass." But you gotta, you know, eventually everybody, you know, yeah, so get right, a little freer. Underway slaves, huh? <laughs> <laughs> hey man, hey, what's the, the words? The language changes. That's all this changes is the language, man. So, 
Take some runaway slaves, bro. Man, it takes some runaway slaves sometimes. Yeah, man. But let, let's 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 change. Let's go to a different road, man. This is getting too dark, bro. Oh no, 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 no! I just I, I appreciate the conversation. I think, like I said, just do your just do your journey, man, and and then everything you've done with the music. Um, yeah. Me being a culture head, I'm a I'm a huge music head too. Just for my my dad is he boy yeah. passed away when he was 73, and that was about two years ago. So he'd yeah. have been 75. So through him, man, I just I I, I got to experience a lot of different music. Um, I could have I could have sworn that I heard robots and and all kind of different and you know different stuff in the music when I was a kid I was a little afraid of it sometimes um but I had I grow to appreciate it man and um you know I think looking back in your career who are who are some of the people that you are you know you were fortunate to rub shoulders with and and create with oh man you know I work with Gil Scott Heron I produced the last poets uh, pollute, uh, pollute, pollute, produced uh, T.S. Monk. Uh, I restored his father's music, Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. I've worked with a lot of people, man. I, I'll be here forever talking about that throughout my career. I, I, I worked with a lot of people. No, that's dope. That's right. dope man. Now, now, are you going to edit this? Um, I, I edit some stuff out. Yeah, what? What you? What you? What you want? <laughs> we'll, I, we'll talk about. No, nah, we're talking about it now, but for sure, man. I, um, afterwards, yeah, no, nah, but, but yeah, he said a lot of stuff, man. There's a lot of stuff, and yeah. and and some of it we did not conclude it. You know, we didn't wrap it up. We just left it open, and, right. and that there a lot of people. <laughs> 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 Well, uh, look at some of that stuff and say, okay, let's, let's either, you know, add on to it or, or take it out. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah no, I see for sure. Um, instead of the world is coming to an end, you know. You say what now? Let's have a better ending instead of, you know, if the world's coming to an end, we're all going to die. <laughs> nah, nah, not at all. It's progress. You know, I said it's progress, man. That's what I believe. You know, I think, like I said, people just understand it more what they consume it. And that's you know that's why I created my podcast because you could you can go anywhere and people could just be talking about people or um, you know this or that and you know these trivial conversations but you know I like to dig a little deeper talk about perspective you know talk about upbringing and you know you know your story is dope man people people understand like you know at the time when you even had turntables it just wasn't even incorporated into the music yet so. It, it was it was risky. It was it was it was it, it was, it was dope. and um, you know it it got shot down. You know people yeah. were feeling it. Even even me playing with Herbie, there was there was people that wasn't feeling that at all. Yeah, yeah. And they were they were hitting him in over the head like, "Yo, man, how you gonna have a guy playing turntables in your band?" Mm -hmm. And it, I remember at a rehearsal. I'm in there rehearsing, and, and in walks Quincy Jones. And he needed to see what he was hearing for himself. You know? mm -hmm. So he came in, and we're sitting there. Herbie, I'm looking at Herbie, and he's like, man, don't, don't look at me. <laughs> you know, that's what he said. He said, don't look at me. Let's play. Right. Let's do Rocket, you know, for Quincy. And so we did Rocket. And when it was over, he, he came over to me, and he bear hugged me. You know, and kind of lifted me up off the ground. He was like, "Man, you're about to change everything, man." You know, yeah. he, had, he had to see it because people didn't get it. They had to see right. it. This guy's right. playing the turntable as a virtuoso. Like he's not playing the record. Yeah, and as touch and feel and texture, he's creating that. Uh, so he obviously was shedding like a musician to create, mm -hmm. you know. And when the musician sees it, like Jaco Pistorius, he came mm -hmm. on stage in Japan in the middle of our set and got up on stage and walked over to the stern turntables and stood in front of me for at least three songs, just mm -hmm. staring at what I was doing. He was like, wow, like, wow. He's literally 
playing the turn. Yeah. It's not, I cannot go home and just do that. And that's when yeah. people go, wow, okay, he's he got something going. Then I had pedals. I had all the pedals. Mm -hmm. I had the cry baby, whammy pedal, DDL, pitch shifter. You know, I had a whole guitar rig connected to my, wow. my rig, the rocket band. Most people, wow. no one that I've seen, I haven't seen anyone do that. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I was dead serious about it. You know, I, I was thinking Hendrix. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my some of my scats, I was thinking Ella. Yeah. You know, I was thinking Monk as far as the, the improvisation side of it. You know, this, these are the people I, I grew up listening to and studied. So it, I had all of these great musicians as, uh, you know, teachers for me to say this is different and I'm going to approach it uh, f through my tutelage through their music. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's dope. Man, no, that's sweet, man. That's sweet. Now, this um, dope stories, man, just to even have that equipment. I, a lot of, you know, a lot of us, we don't really know what that equipment. I can put the pieces together because, you know, I, I produce. So I, I kind of know exactly what you're saying. But, um, you know, you're you're scratching. Well, you, we're not scratching. Well, you're picking up, you're dropping, and you're, the pedals are at your feet, right? These are these are what you're using when you say pedals. If you go to the Rocket Band live in London, England, and mm -hmm. look, listen to what I'm doing. It's it's I'm doing all kind of stuff with the sound. I got pedals right. on the. Floor. I got right. everything the player has. I have that yeah. on, or on the turn table. That's sweet. That's crazy. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. That's man. You know, and like just the the performance of it is uh is it is masterful. It sounds it sounds crazy. Um, so is this a part of, is it going to be part of, uh, your live, your live show? Um, the journey project I'm talking about. Yeah. No, this is a performance play. It started out as a record. Okay. Okay. I already recorded the last poets. I had, they're already on it. I recorded okay. Andy Stone and Allison Williams. And, okay. uh, uh, there's a young lady named, uh, Nini Ali that I, I want to record. I'm going to work with her soon. Uh, Jesse West, uh, the Kingpin Shaheen from the, my, one of my old groups, Infinity Four, uh, various artists. I'm going to oh. work on this. It, it's a it's a story of our our just journey, our journey from from getting here, and how we use our cultural expressions to get us through the trauma. Right, right. You know, we keep coming up with it, no matter how hard you step on it you know we're, we're roaches you know mm -hmm. right no nah, facts <laughs> no matter what you <laughs> step on it you put your feet pick your feet up he's back spinning on the floor so you know it's it's that story and um i was i'm talking to uh mick jagger of uh, doing one of the monologues mm -hmm. We, I, I didn't know that uh, slavery was uh, outlawed in in England first. Yeah, I found that out mm. within no, the last know years. I, I didn't know that. No, I didn't and, know either. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I asked uh, Mick Jagger if he would do the monologue of that, telling that story for this this performance play. No, that's awesome. Yeah. That's me dope. What about on the music side of things? You um uh right now I'm uh I was just I just got a call to do another uh, restoration of a Thelonious Monk tape that was just found. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the journey is a recording project. It's a performance project, but so we have to record it. And now that AI exists, I can do renditions of some of the the visuals that have mm. come that's going to be part of uh, the project. And gotcha. so, I, you know, I didn't know how to get through that. It was going to take a long time. And now I can, I can just say it and get a, a rendition of what I'm looking at to show to some of the graphic art, graphic artists to create for me. Oh, no, that's going to be sweet, man. We're looking forward to that, the journey. Um, that's going to be awesome, man. It's been, it's been dope talking to you, bro. I think, um, you know, we got a good feel for 
your journey, you know, your upbringing, your contribution to hip hop, you know, how that thing, you know, how that started, um, you know, your, uh, you okay. know, your relationship with the turntables. If you need more, just hit me up, bro. <laughs> nah, for sure, for sure. Now nah, we can expand on some conversations too, man. I know, you know, you didn't want to get too deep, but you know, I, uh, I love the conversation because I think that that sparks it. You know, that sparks that 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 idea. You never know who might be listening. So, um, right. yeah, no, I appreciate you. You know, you know, for you know, just spreading that light, the terminology. You know, the ideas about terms. You know, the sapphire, um, these different things. You know, people. You know, are gems. You know, they open open that your mind when you. Your wolf hypothesis. Okay, yeah. so they didn't catch that. The sapphire or sapphire wolf hypothesis. Right. Check that out. No, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, we appreciate you, man. You know, it's been dope. You know, spending this hour and thirty. You done been on for hour and thirty with me, bro. So I really, I really do. Um, and uh, yeah, man. Hopefully, we can have the conversation again. We look forward to the journey. And, and, and hit, um, me up, bro. hit me up. Call, call, nah, call. for sure. You know, and and we can we can build outside of this. Nah, for sure, for sure. Let's do that. You no, know, I mean, if you're doing production. Uh, like I said, I'm working on this project and, you know, you know, maybe you can, you can participate. Who knows? <clears throat> nah, for sure. That'd be love. That'd yeah. be real love. Yeah. Let's yep. expand on that for sure. Yeah. All right, bro. Thank All right, you. I'm let you go, bro. I really appreciate it. I had fun here. And uh, anytime, anytime. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's been Grand Mixer DXT. Peace. Two pieces. Yes, sir. So that was Grand Mixer, DXT. Had a great conversation, man. That was dope. Um, broke down a little bit of, you know, his upbringing, his culture, Bronx, um, his family, um, what influenced him to get into the turntables, how that changed the culture of hip hop at the time, the dance culture, um, where music has gone since the mental health state of, you know, our culture, our youth, the weaponizing of the work of the, of the, um, the music and how we can transform it to a tool, you know, uh, lessons to be learned. So this has been a great conversation. Um, a lot of gems in this and, uh, guys, just thank you for tuning in. Appreciate you for being here today. It's been fun. Peace.